there? Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah. Boom. Da 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 da. Hey, I can hear it. There it is. There it is. I almost broke into song. That would have been so scary. You guys would have ran for the hills, man. It would have been bad, bad. Hey, it's good to see everybody today. What a great time for us to gather together. I am so glad that you guys made it out today. It just, I just love gathering on Saturday nights and, and, and having some great worship and then having a great time to be able to open up the Word of God. Now, those of you that don't know and, 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 and those of you that do, this is the fourth in the series uh, entitled Out of the Heart. And basically what we're doing is we're taking a look at those things, you know, those things that every once in a while, whenever you're kind of going about life and life kind of squeezes you a little bit. In other words, things get a little difficult. Something happens. Bottom falls out. You lose a job. Somebody kind of just makes you a little angry. You know, something just happens and then something comes out of you, right? You say something. You think something. You do something. And then you kind of look around because now you're embarrassed and you say, where did that come from? And, and, and your first reaction is to say, that's not like me. And, and, and it is. Because the truth is, is that Jesus would say, well, it's just like you because that actually came from your heart. That is who you are. Deep down inside, it's who you are. And then whenever you got squeezed, it's what came out. So what we've been doing over the course of the last four weeks, three weeks, is we're taking a look at those things that get lodged in our heart. And, and, and as they get lodged in the heart, they, they, they start out as little monsters, and then they grow, and they get larger and larger and larger monsters, and then they get to the point to where they affect the things that we think, the things that we say, and the things that we do. It impacts all areas of life. And so far, what we did is we took a look at guilt. We took a look at how guilt gets, gets lodged in our heart, and we talked about the way to get rid of guilt is to confess guilt. And then we talked about jealousy. Last week we talked about jealousy and we talked about the way, one of the ways to get rid of jealousy is first and foremost to admit it, to go to, 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 to God and say, hey, you know what, I'm struggling with this thing. Can you please help me? But then the second thing is to go to the person that we're jealous of. And then the third is to celebrate other people's success. So whenever we celebrate other people's success, it, it roots out that jealousy inside of us. And this week I received a message and I, I thought, you know what, I just want to share this. Not, not, because, not because it says great things about me and about the, the, the message series, but because I think that you're a lot like I am. And when somebody else kind of verbalizes, hey, I, I struggle with this, and then they talk about how they themselves kind of overcame it, it helps me and makes me come to a place where I go, hey, you know what, I, I can do that. I can step into it. If they were willing to do it, then I'm willing to do it. So I just want to read this to you. This came to me this week. It says, I just wanted to say thank you. This is, says to Lance. I just want to say thank you for preaching on the Out of the Heart series, specifically on guilt. During the message, I thought you were a bit crazy. Yeah, most people do. But then the Lord tugged on my heartstrings all week, and I knew what I needed to do. I felt I couldn't, I couldn't because I feared it was going, it, it was going to be so much worse I beat myself up all week to the point of not sleeping and constantly crying. Finally, yesterday, I gave it all to God, and I trusted he would carry me through it. I confessed some things that have been haunting me for years, and not only did, I, did it go, go better than I expected, I immediately felt like a million bricks were lifted off my chest. I could breathe, smile, and go on with life without the guilt I've been shoving down for a long time. Your message wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it's what I needed to hear. So I, I like I said, I, I share that because I want you to know, where, no matter where you're at, and, and you've probably been listening to the messages, and, and you've probably from time to time think, you know what, that's just nuts. Who does that? It's so much easier just to shove it down and to pretend like it's not there. And, and it really isn't affecting that much, but if you really take a look at the time of your life and look at all of the, 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 the different aspects of your life and the, the relationships in your life, you see that that guilt affects everything. And it is so, so difficult to be able to identify, and it's so difficult to, to go ahead and confess. But once you do, it's amazing how all of a sudden God just takes care of that. So I encourage you. I encourage you to, ta to take care of whatever it is that God's kind of leaning into your heart with. You know, th that first week I told you I sent everybody the, the, with some homework to go home and to begin to pray and say, God, show me what's in my heart. So I just encourage you to keep praying that prayer. And as God begins to show you those things that are in your heart, then you take them to him because it's only through him, right? It's through what he did on the cross that we have the ability to be able to go to him and ask him to root those things out. But 
you've got to face it. You've got to do the hard stuff. You've got to do the hard stuff. So today, today we're going to talk about something that's really, this is a difficult subject. It is just a hard thing. Last week, we talked about how, how most people don't want to admit that they're jealous because it seems so childish, right? I mean, because jealousy, that's something children struggle with. That's not something adults struggle with. And, and, and we talked about how it masks itself and everything else. But today, we're going to talk about those things that, that really, honestly, it's not so much, it's difficult to admit it's difficult to see in ourselves. We, it, it's not something you naturally just look at, your, at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I struggle with greed. Greed is just not one of those things that we look at and say, man, I struggle with that. Most of us in the room, we could all say, you know, I wish I was more generous, right? But I'm not greedy. I, I, I'm not greedy. Tr trust me, I'm not greedy. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever met anybody who sincerely looked at me and said, you know what? I'm just greedy. I'm just greedy. And the reason is because most of us don't see ourselves as ever being greedy. And, and greed kind of masks itself in a virtue, doesn't it? We, we kind of say to ourselves, you know, we, we, we're struggling with greed, but we say, you know, I'm just careful. I'm just frugal. I'm a saver. I'm just watching out for my family. I'm, I'm just trying to be a good steward. And those are the things that we end up saying. And, and listen, I am not saying that those are bad things because those are virtuous things that we ought to be doing. But what we do is we mask our greed behind these subjects, behind these virtues. And we say, this is why I do what I do. This is the struggle that I have. And then on top of that, one of the reasons that we don't, we, we don't identify greed is because whenever we think of greed, we think of this person right here. He'll come. There he is. Right? I mean, the minute you think of greed, you think of Scrooge. And, and you're thinking, I'm not Scrooge. I, 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 you know, somebody is walking around with no compassion whatsoever and could care less about anybody else's struggles or anybody else's. They only want what they've got. So the fact is, is that whenever we think of greed, we kind of look at it and say, you know, I'm not one of those people who struggle with that. But what we're going to discover today is that greed is different than just a Scrooge greed. There's all different types of greed. As a matter of fact, Jesus, whenever he kind of gave his definitive statement on greed... He, he lets us know that there are all different forms of greed. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, and let me just give you a little bit of a background here. Jesus is he's teaching and he's walking along, and, and as, as he often did, you know, he's just kind of conveying messages and he's letting people know this is the way you live the life, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And someone breaks in, and we don't know if they kind of run up to the situation or if they just interrupt his conversation or how it is, but someone runs up to Jesus and they say, Jesus. Or they, they say, good teacher, would you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? And it's interesting because Jesus looks at him and kind of says, well, who made me the judge? Who made me the arbiter over your situation? Why would I be the one to go ahead and take care of this situation? And he doesn't wait for them to respond. He responds immediately. Listen to what he says. As, as this person is coming, he's asked this question. He says, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of of greed. Now, within the context of the setting here, this is amazing because a guy, a young man, is running up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, Jesus, he's got more than I have. He's carrying all of the inheritance, and I deserve this inheritance. Mom and dad want me to have the inheritance. They wrote it out. I should have this. And you would think everybody around the, around the room or around the, the, the area where Jesus was at, they would probably all be looking at the brother, whether it was an older brother or a younger brother, I don't know, probably older, and, and, and look at him and say, man, you're so greedy. But Jesus looks at the situation and he basically says, be on guard of all kinds of greed. Not just the type of greed that you would normally say, okay, it's obvious because you're holding on to everything. You've got it all in your hands and you refuse to share with anybody. There's that type of greed. But Jesus says, it could also be the one who's asking the question, he could have a greedy heart. Even though something is due to him, the, the reason or the motivation behind him asking may actually come out of greed. So Jesus says, be on guard of various types of greed. And then he goes on and he, he, he kind of qualifies it. The second part of, of that verse, he says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So basically what he's saying is that, listen, you can't define who you are and how, how well you're doing or how, how important you are or the things that you've achieved by the things that you have grabbed hold of. 
And then Jesus goes on to tell a story. He tells the story of a farmer, right? I mean, if you know anything about the story, you know that he, he's sitting there. He, he says, well, there was a farmer, and he had a bumper crop, just had an incredible uh, amount of stuff. And all this harvest came in, and he, he brings it in. He begins to divide it as he's taking it. And he says, okay, I've got all the stuff that I need. I've got all the stuff that I'm going to need into the future, maybe a year into the future. And now I've got an abundance. I have some leftover. What should I do with my leftover? And he makes a decision. I got it. I'll build more barns. I'll just get more because that's the frugal thing to do. That's the saving thing to do, right? That's looking out for my family. And Jesus, yet Jesus uses this as the story. Even though in our minds we think that's exactly what we ought to be doing. And Jesus looks and says, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Well, Jesus... That's the American dream. How, how, how can you say that that's not the way we ought to be living? That, that life isn't about getting and keeping and storing. That life is about providing for you and providing for your family, but then ultimately also to be providing for others. Jesus, that doesn't fit with the American dream, which at that point I think Jesus would say, yeah, it doesn't. Because here's an interesting thing. Let, let's just, just for a moment, I want you to think, let, let, let's assume, let's pretend, whatever, that, that there are aliens and that they live somewhere out there and, and, you know, they're flying around and they decide, hey, let's go visit Earth. But instead of visiting Earth and going to, like, Zimbabwe, they go to America. And as they show up in America and they're just observing, they're watching us, right? And they're looking around and they see all of our malls and all of our grocery stores and our mini marts and our auto stores and our... Our, our motorcycle stores and our guitar stores and, 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 and all the different things that we have and all the places to go and to spend money and all the activity that we have going and coming and buying and selling and everything that happens, they would assume as they were looking at everything that we were doing, they would say, oh, you know what? I think that if they don't buy and, and accumulate, they're going to die. That that's part of breathing for them. Right? I mean, I know some of you are saying, oh, I'm not like that. But truthfully, whenever you really look at it, and, and here, here's the thing. Let me, let me just kind of put this to bed real quick. Because the men, the men in the room, you're all going, yeah, yeah that's my wife. She's buying all the time. And, and see, listen, listen. And, you know, maybe in the sheer volume of stuff, there might be the fact that the ladies are buying more things. But you gentlemen, when you buy, you break the bank, man. You go out, you may only buy one item, but it's worth a thousand of the ones that they bought, right? And, and then you look, oh, I'm, I'll, I'll, this, I'll have to have marriage counseling if I keep going, so I'm just, <laughs> I'm going to stop there. But if they were to look and they would say, they, they would look at, at our garage and they'd say, the garage is filled, the house is filled, the closet is, or, is filled, the attic's filled, everything's filled. Oh, and by the way, just in case, they go and buy another storage unit. Because it's all about accumulating stuff. Because even though we know that the bumper sticker is correct, you know, the one who dies with the most toys just dies. And we kind of understand that. And we know that. But we live as though the one who dies with the most toys wins. It's just the way we go about business. And Jesus says, no, 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 you have missed it. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of of his possessions. But Lance, this is the land of the free. We are free to go into debt to buy more. And you're right. And we exercise that freedom, don't we? Constantly. And then here's the situation. Listen, listen. Here, here, here's what happens. We go out and we buy stuff on ourselves. And most of the stuff we buy is stuff that we really don't need. But we buy it anyway. We just get it and we just accumulate it. We put it into our, our little areas and little things. And we don't really, a lot of times we don't even use. Or, or we consume it and then we're still paying on it anyway. Just as crazy anyhow. But anyway, we, we do all of this. And then a need comes up. We meet somebody who is in dire need, in a difficult situation. 
And our hearts go out for them, and we think, oh, man, I'd love to help. Or maybe, maybe the organization that we're a part of, maybe the church that we're a part of, you know, the organization that we're a part of that, that's impacting the community that we live in, and we'd love to be able to, to get behind them and to help them and to do the things that, that, that they're doing and to further that, that cause and further the kingdom. And we know that there's a need, and we look at it and we say, oh, man, I'd love to help. And what do we do? What do we do? Immediately, the moment that someone says there's a need, we bring somebody up here and somebody says, oh, you know, I'm really going through a difficult time. Or we talk about the church and some of the needs in the church. And the first thing we do is we look at our checkbook or we pull in our pockets and we go, you know, kind of short on money right now. Love to help you, but I can't. And at that point, I think God's looking at us and saying, what? Since when did you... Since, since when did you make decisions, financial decisions, based upon how much money you have? Because you constantly go out and spend money and buy things that you don't have the money for, but yet you buy it on for yourself. And now here's a need that is outside of yourself. And what do you do? You don't look at your credit card. You look at your bank statement. And you, you, you actually, for the first time, you make a decision based upon what you have instead of based upon what you think you can acquire in debt. And, and, and please hear me, I, I, nobody walk out here and, and, and hear me say, you know, I'm saying you need to take your visa and you need to make sure you charitable giving through your visa. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that because we put ourselves in a position where we buy and we buy and we buy and we spend and we spend and we spend. And this is what Jesus is telling. We spend and we spend and we spend on ourselves. We put ourselves in a position to where whenever a need shows up, we can't do anything for that need. We want to do something for that need. We want to help out in any way that we possibly can. But we can't. Why do we do that? Why do we make decisions about your need based upon my checkbook? But my want based upon my visa card. Because it's really not a financial problem. It's not a financial issue that we struggle with. This is a heart issue. This is a greed issue. This is a I want more, I've got to have more issue. And if you remember, whenever we first started this, I said that these things that we're looking at, the best way to look at them is in a debt-debtor relationship, right? And I said guilt says I owe you. I've offended you, I've hurt you, I've done something to you. So now I come to you and I say, I owe you an apology, I owe you something, right? And then we said, last week we said, jealousy says, God owes me. You know, you've been blessed, you've been taken care of, God took care of you, God should have taken care of me. I'm doing all the things that I wouldn't, I'm supposed to be doing. I'm reading my Bible, I'm going to church, I'm, I'm helping old ladies across, the, church, across the, the street. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, and yet God blesses you. And I'm jealous of that. And God, how dare you? You owe me. Greed says, I owe me. I work hard for that money. It's my money. I deserve this. And when greed gets lodged in your heart, just like all the others, but when it gets lodged in your heart, not only does it affect you financially, put you in financial binds, it affects all of your relationships as well. It gets to the place to where the people around you, they start thinking that the things you have, your possessions, or the job you have to work so you can work 70 hours a week so that you can have the possessions, that those things are more important than themselves, and they begin to resent that, it affects your relationships. And then whenever a need comes up, and you're unable to meet that need, unable to make to take care of that need, but then you turn back around and you go and buy something and somebody's watching and they're going, ah, it affects the relationship. Greed is one of those things that get lodged in the heart. And again, it's not a financial issue, it's a heart issue. And, and we, we so deceive ourselves. I, 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 I believe this with everything in my heart. I, I am constantly lying to myself. I, I don't know if you lie to yourself, but I constantly lie to myself. I'm constantly telling me, oh, that's fine. Oh, you deserve that. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Or, or here, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Whenever there's a need, right, there's a huge need, and I want so badly to meet the need, right? I, want, I mean, everything inside of me, my heart goes out to the need. I want to meet the need. Look at my checkbook. I can't meet the need. But I feel pretty good because I wanted to, right? 
It wasn't like I was cold. It wasn't like I said, well, too bad for you. You made your bed, man. Go lay in it, right? It's not like I was Scrooge. I really wanted to. And see, we think, we think, we think greed is an income problem. If I could make more, I'd give more. Statistics show that that doesn't happen. Those that make the most give the least percentage wise. It's amazing how that happens. So, really, it's not about if I made more, I'd give more. You know what it's really about? Listen, listen, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to back it up here in a second. It, it, it really, it, it, it's about if you give, then you begin to become generous. It's amazing how this happens. See, one of the ways you break greed in your heart is you give. Priority, percentage, giving. You make a decision, this is what I'm going to give, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to fund God's kingdom, I'm going to fund God's stuff, way before I fund my stuff. And when you do that, it begins to change your heart. Listen, I know some of you are going, I don't know if I buy into that. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. This is Jesus speaking. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So let me just clarify. Jesus is not saying, and, and this is so important, he's not saying don't save. He's not saying don't put money away for a college fund. He's not saying don't... Don't you know, put money away for that, that car that you need. He, he's, he's not saying any of those things. Matter of fact, if you look in a lot of the things Jesus talks about, he talks about preparing for the future. And then you look in the book of Proverbs. They, they, they talk about be like the ant and you know, store away and make sure that you're ready for winter. So Jesus is not saying don't save. He's not. But what he is saying and what he will ultimately say is don't buy into what the world is teaching you. That you've got to accumulate that you got to have it, that you need it. Listen to this. He goes on. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, I don't, have you ever been driving down the road and seen a bank of heaven? I, I have never seen a bank of heaven. Anybody ever seen a bank of heaven? I've never seen one. So I'm not quite sure how do we store up things in heaven, treasures in heaven. How, how do we do that? See, this is Jesus speak for give stuff away. That's what he's saying. You want to store up stuff in, in, in a place where nobody can steal it, nobody can take it away, where it fully satisfies, where it, it, it goes beyond you, then you give stuff away. And you say, I don't know if I believe that. Luke chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus speaking, he says, sell your possessions to give to charity. Make yourselves purses which do not wear out and an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief can come, come near nor moth can destroy. So when Jesus says store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, he's saying give some of your stuff away. Reallocate your stuff and give it away. Why should we do that, Jesus? And he gives us the reason why. And the natural reason that we would all say, well, because other people have need, right? I mean, there, there, are, there are homeless people and there are people that, that, that aren't even homeless that have tremendous need and, and they, they need the money. They need uh, some of our possessions. They need some of these things, these extra things that we have. We could bless them by giving them. So that would be a natural, okay, Jesus, I should do it because there is such a tremendous need. But actually, and that's important, but, but there's more to it than that. It's not just the fact that there is a need, but it's also the fact that your heart, in doing this, it aligns your heart with God's heart. Listen to what he says again. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break, and break in and steal. Why? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want to know where your heart is? And, and everybody in the room, we'd all say, I got a good heart. I, I'm very compassionate. I, my heart goes out to people, you know, whenever things are happening around the world and I watch it on the news, my heart breaks and I write a check and I do this and I do that. If you really want to know where your heart is, take a look at the places that you spend your money. Because where this, oops, where this is, this goes. It's just the way it is. It's a principle. 
It's the way things happen. Where you send this, this follows. It just does. So you want to know where your heart is? Look at your check registry. Look at your visa bills. That'll tell you where your heart is. And like I said, this is a difficult situation. This, this is one of those things. And some of you are here and you're going, you know what? I just check in this church out and man, I'm not even a church guy. I'm not even sure that I believe in this Jesus guy. And oh my goodness, somebody invited me and they said, hey, you should come because we talked about guilt and we talked about jealousy and oh, it's been so great. And now he's talking about money. That's why I didn't go to church before because everybody's always talking about money. This isn't a money issue. This is a heart issue. This is something where Greed gets stuck in your heart, and you find yourself spending stuff on yourself. And then when the true need comes along, you can't. And Jesus says where this is, this follows. And if that's true, because th this is pretty cool. If that's true, if you want to find out where your heart is, then you can look at where your money goes. Then we could probably flip that on its ear, couldn't we? So if we want our heart to go someplace, we could send this someplace, right? Because we never really think about where we're sending it. We're just sending it. And what Jesus is saying, where you sent it is where your heart goes. But now if you are real intentional and you say, I'm going to send this to the places I want it to go to because that's where I want my heart to be. That's what he says. He says that we can actually direct our heart by where we send our things. Listen to this. And this is, this is going to get a little bit confusing, but I want you to hold on with me and just kind of stay because, and I'll, I'll hopefully explain it completely. Verse 22. So this is right after. For where your treasure is, there, there your heart will be also. Verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is within you is darkness, how great is the darkness. Now listen, this is what Jesus is saying. He says, the eye is the light or, or the, 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 the lamp of the body. So he, he's literally saying that the eye, is it directs where the body goes. And, and we, we kind of understand that. Like if you've ever been driving down the road and you see something and it's over to the right and you kind of look to the right and your car kind of goes to the right because, you know, it's, it's like an automatic thing. And you go, oh, whoa, you know, and you pull it back in or something. And if you're riding a bike, the same thing happens. You're riding a bike and you look off to the, to the right and you kind of naturally go that way. Whenever I was th this year, whenever J Jared and I were learning how to, to surf. They kept telling me, because I'd fall over and over and over again, and the, the instructor kept telling me, I want you to look up. I want you to look to the horizon. Let your eyes guide you. Look to where you want to go. Let your eyes take you to that place. And I kept thinking, no, i got to look at this board because I'm standing on the board, and it's moving, and i got to look at the wind and the waves and everything that's happening. i got to look down. And every time I looked down, that's where I went. I fell. And it wasn't until after like the sixth or seventh time, and I was so tired of falling, and I finally it hit me, and I said, okay, no matter what, I am going to look up. And I looked up, and I stayed up, and I continued all the way. Because where your eyes go, your body follows. So he uses that principle, and he says, where your eyes go, your body follows. And then he turns back around, and he says, if your eyes are good, and that Greek word good there, it literally means single-minded or single vision or focused or sincere. So if your eyes are focused on something single, on, on, on what it is that God wants, then the light that is within you will fill all of your body. That's what he's saying. And then he turns back around and he says, but if your eyes are bad, and that word bad in the Greek, it means envious. As a matter of fact, it's translated envious in, Mar in Matthew chapter 20, verse 15. If you go back there and you take a look, that's the same Greek word. So Jesus is saying, and let, let's, just, let's just see if we can put all this together. He says, if your eyes are good, focused on God's desires for your things, then your whole body will be full of light. But if you have bad or envious eyes, I want, I've got to have then your whole body will be full of darkness. He's saying it affects all of your relationships. 
And we know that, right? If you're here today and you're married or have ever been married, you know the number one conflict in marriage is money, finances. How can that be possible? How can paper with a dead president's picture affect my love life? That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, it makes sense when you understand that if you use this incorrectly, then it will affect your relationship. That's what Jesus is saying. If you use it correctly, it'll strengthen the relationships. Not only will it strengthen the relationships, but ultimately, you'll have this light, this joy that is inside of you. Let me ask you something. Have you ever met somebody who was just, I mean, we're talking uber generous, right? Over the top generous. Somebody that would just, they, they, they're just willing to do anything. It's just amazing. You get around them, you go, wow, how do you do that? Have you ever met somebody like that? Aren't they the most joyful people you know? I mean, you get around them, and it's just so hard to not be joyful with them because they're so full of joy. But have you ever been around somebody who's full of greed and envy? And there's no joy there. None whatsoever. Because it's all about keeping or acquiring or getting or storing or hiding. Jesus says this is not a financial issue. This is a heart issue. And greed gets lodged in your heart and you don't know it and it masks itself as all kinds of virtuous stuff. But the truth is, the truth is, most of us finance our kingdom first. Way before we finance anything God wants. Way before. And then look at the way Jesus wraps this up. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some of your translations may, may say mammon. The literal translation is stuff, things, things of this world. You cannot. Jesus says you cannot, you can't be double-minded and have a single focus. Jesus said, let me, let me say this again, because some of you are probably going to struggle with this. You're going to go home saying, yeah, see, preacher said I got to give more. Let me, let me just tell you, Jesus is not interested in your money. He's interested in your heart. And because your heart, or because your money directs your heart, he's very interested in the devotion of your heart. And he wants it to be in the right place. So as you look in the scripture, what you see is that the way you break the grip of greed in your life is through generous giving. But Lance, you understand, I don't make enough. I get that. I do. I, I understand. Try it. Just make a determination. Say, you know what? X amount of dollars I'm going to give. And watch what God does. Watch what he does. And watch how it breaks that stuff inside of you. And you begin to feel, not only feel for other people, but you're able to help other people and the joy that is bubbling, bubbling up inside of you. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to call you to action. Each one of you have a connection card inside of your, your bulletins there, which should be on your tables. And on the connection card, on the back side, it says, I will break the grip of greed by giving generously, or maybe generous giving. I don't know. I, you guys, you, well, I got one right here. here. I'll tell you exactly what it says. I will break the grip of greed, greed in my heart by being generous. So if you would say, you know what, Pastor? I'm there. I'll do this. I'll do this. Would you do me a favor? Would you just take this and put a little X or a little check there? And it would be great if you gave your name on the front so that I could be praying for you, but I know some of you are going to think, well, you know what? He probably knows who gives, and then he'll be watching for my money. But you just need to know, I don't know any of that stuff. I don't want to know any of that stuff. So really, it's not about that. But it'd be really cool if you made that commitment. And you watch what God did in your heart. And watch how he breaks that grip. It's amazing. It's amazing. And everything, like all everything that we've talked about, it starts by you going to him and asking him to forgive you. 
When he points it out and he says, you've been a little greedy, haven't you? But I'm not Scrooge. No, you're not. But you've been a little greedy, haven't you? And you say, yes, I have. And you admit it. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather here. Lord, I thank you for this, for this series. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for how it guides us and directs us, how it teaches us, how it speaks to our innermost need. And God, the truth is, each one of us, we all struggle with a little bit of greed someplace. We just got a little bit of selfish desire in us. God, I pray that you would help us. That, Lord, as we come to you, as we seek you, that, God, you would forgive us. And that you would help us to break the grip of greed by giving. So, Lord, I ask this in your precious and holy name. I can't be can be left behind no one else will do and I will take hold of you cause I need you Jesus to come to my rescue Tell me where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved. Won't you capture me with grace? I will follow.
This world has nothing for me. This world has nothing for me. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. This world has nothing for me. This world has nothing for me. Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Tell me where else can I go? There's no you capture me with grace won't you capture me with grace won't you capture me with your grace I will follow you God, I pray that you would be paramount in our hearts, God, that you would be the pinnacle, that you would be the center of it all, God. God, and that our, our money and the things that we treasure in this world, God, the things that we care about, God, that they would reflect our love for you, God. I pray that you would be the center of it all and that that wouldn't just be something we say, God, but that would be something that we do. Because this world, it has nothing for me. God, I know it's got nothing for any of us, Lord. But everything that you are, God, everything that you've done, God, I just pray that that would be, that would be everything that we care about and everything that we live for, God. Let's sing it again, church. This world has nothing for me. 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 Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Tell me where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved. Won't you capture me with grace? Won't you capture me with grace? Won't you capture me with your grace? I will follow. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love. I need you Though my world will fall I'll never let you go Your 
Taking me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know, and I love you. I need you, though my world will fall, I'll never let you go. You're my savior. God, I thank you for all that you do, Lord. I know we can't thank you enough. But God, I pray that as we go on our way from here, God, that, that some of the things that you had Lance say, God, that they would ring true in our hearts, God, that, that you would be above all else in this world, God. We thank you for all that you do, Lord. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. All right, God bless you guys, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.